was often known as the 200 mile an hour man. I seemed to be here, there, everywhere. I had, um, I had a cracking job, still have with Kellogg's. Uh, I was a maintenance fitter. I was working shifts. So the beauty of working shifts was it, it gave me a lot of time off. Um, during that time, I spent a great deal of it working for the special constabulary. Um, where I'd been um, a special for some 18 years or so, hadn't I? And I mm -hmm. absolutely loved that job, job to the full. I really did. Um, I also had another interest, which was um, I'd started a small business off producing our own sausages and bacon. Thankfully, that is still going, but in a different way now because I can't do half the things that I used to be able to do. So my, my typical day would be I'd finish shifts, um, I'd have a bite to eat, I'd quite often go straight off to the police or I'd do the pigs first. And I basically never had a minute where I was, um, was sitting around doing nothing. I was always doing something. I've always liked um, fast cars. Back in the 80s, I had a 2.8 injection Capri. Uh, developed, you know, I, I got lots of other fairly quick cars, whatever the budget would allow at the time. Uh, in 2007, I owned uh, a Mercedes CLK 3.2 convertible, which was, it was fairly quick, but I bought that because it was open top and I loved open top motoring. Uh, this was rather expensive to run, so the plan was uh, I'd buy a kit car. Uh, I knew someone selling one. I had a little bit of spare cash, so I thought I'd buy it. It'd be a bit of a laugh, a bit of a giggle. It was a Tiger Super 6. Uh, it had a Ford 2.0-litre ZTEC engine. It was fairly quick, very loud because it had a side exhaust pipe on it. Obviously with it being a kit car, it doesn't have the modern um, safety features a, a production built car would have, like um, airbags, side impact bars, anti-lock brakes and all that sort of stuff. It was a real basic car, just a chassis with a bit of fiberglass covering, an engine and set of brakes and that was it. I was doing some gardening work at a, at a place where I was living. It was a quite a substantial garden that, that I was doing the work for, cutting grasses, hedge, things like that. And, and I was asked by a gentleman who also lived there, who part owned one of the apartments, if I would um, trim some branches which were overhanging his garage. And um, yeah, I've, I've used a chainsaw before, I've cut logs up, and I didn't see any reason why this would be any different. Uh, I was out driving with my nephew and we were driving down a country lane and a car pulled out in front of me, causing me to brake hard. As it did so, I realised that the um, front offside wheel skidded and left a skid mark on the road and that the left wheel didn't skid. Immediately I thought, are my brakes balanced? Uh, is there a problem with the car? But that was closely followed by uh, the fact that the left wheel, I was on a country lane, there was no curbs there, so I just thought, it's in gravel, probably a bit of mud on the road or whatever, that's why it hadn't left a skid mark. That afternoon I was due um, a brand new sausage wrapping machine and, and my main aim was oh, let's get, let's get on and, and mess around with that. So that started really the day and um, I woke up off nights early. I got up at something like just after 11 o'clock but there was only eight branches to do and I said to Wendy that I'm, I'm going to get on and crack, crack on with the job. And I got the chainsaw and um, I put my wellies on because that's what I wear when I'm at home. I haven't got steel toe caps at home, I've never had them. Yeah, in work I, I, I have to wear them, but at home I don't. Anyway, that night in the pub, I uh, met a friend of mine who's an MOT inspector. I told him what had happened and he came to the same conclusion as me. He says, your bricks are probably all right, but if you bring it into the MOT centre, I'll put it on the machine and we'll test them for you. So the next day I got up and that was on my list of things to do. But as I was driving there, I was driving down this country lane again, uh, it was a beautiful morning, the trees covered the road, it was a really nice feeling, the exhaust was loud, so it really echoed off the trees, it was really good. At which point another neighbour of mine turns up in his car and he said to me that he'd foot the bottom of the ladder. Brilliant. I thought, great, well I've got that boxed off. Now, the, the branches that are cut off were probably about between 13 to 15 foot up in the air. And I always made sure that the runs were a good three, four runs higher than the branch. And I didn't think anything was wrong with it. So I commenced cutting the first branch and um, it came down no problem. And so did the other six. Now, probably realistically about 20 minutes had gone by by now. And um, I would, again, I was feeling guilty because I was using an awful lot of um, my neighbor's time up or I felt as though I was. So I, I thanked him for what he'd done and I only had one branch left to do. 
but at which point the delivery guy turns up with my new, you know, my new piece of kit. What happened then is my neighbour went in and I asked Wendy if she'd come down um, to foot the ladder um, for the last branch. Now this particular branch had a lot of foliage on it. We're in August, there was a lot of foliage, a lot of weight on it. And it may have been a foot or two higher than the others, but it still was well, well beyond what I thought was the safety limit as far as the number of runs on the ladder goes. I took the cut and then I heard a different noise and it was a completely different cracking noise than the other branches, almost as if it was hollow. But in hindsight, I think it was because the branch was longer and heavier. And as this fell away, the part of the branch that my ladder was now resting on acted almost as a catapult and it flicked up in the air. And I can remember clearly the ladder falling away from me, falling forward. And I can remember seeing all the woods in front of me. And then I can remember going through the air backwards at a great rate of knots. I couldn't hear anything, nothing at all, and it was strange because I couldn't hear the chainsaw, I couldn't hear birds, I couldn't hear anything, and I thought, what, what's gone on here? Then I looked to the left hand side of me, and that's where I saw Wendy lying there. And I initially thought I'd broken her neck. I'd obviously hit her on the way down, and she was knocked out or unconscious. I was holding the ladder, and Basically, I could hear the chainsaw going. And the next minute, um, I don't remember anything. I was on the floor with a burning sensation across my neck, um, really not knowing what had happened. Um, I saw Mike lying there, told me to go and phone for an ambulance, went round to the neighbours, they phoned the ambulance, and then we all went back to you, didn't we, to yeah. comfort you. And I said, didn't I, that, you know, don't move me, I've broken my back. None of us were allowed to touch No, you. nobody to touch me. But I wasn't in any pain, was no, I, for no. a good few moments. I couldn't, f and, and some people say it was shock, and yeah, maybe it might have been, but I think I realised how, how serious this possibly was. Uh, as I came out of the clearing, uh, away from the trees, I was looking down a bit of a slope, and down the bottom I could see a young woman with a pushchair and I thought I'm going too fast and the car's too loud I didn't want to startle her or the baby so I decided to slow down as soon as I touched the brakes the back end just went away on me everything went blank from there on but I was led to believe that I, I did a couple of circles and bounced off a sandstone wall a couple of times the next thing I do remember was coming to in the car and I went to release the seatbelt um, but as I, as I stretched down to, to undo it, the, um, the belt was still attached to the receiver, but the receiver was, had come away from the car, and the bolt was still actually in it. Uh, I did, did point this out to the paramedic, and he said, yes, I've seen that. At which point I thought, right, let's get out of the car now. He, he just uh, stopped me immediately. He said, you can't do that. He says, we've got to wait because we don't know what your injuries are. We need to wait for the fire brigade. Again, the next thing I remember, the fire brigade were there and they helped me out, they lifted me out and placed me carefully onto a trolley and surrounded me with all the foam blocks because again, they didn't know what injuries I had. I then had a short journey in the ambulance to the um, Wrexham Myler Hospital and it was at this point that I realised that my vision was going. I brought this to the attention of the paramedic and he said they'll sort all that out for you. When we got to the hospital, I can remember being then taken straight to the recovery room, which is where I spent the next eight hours basically in recovery room with Wendy at my side. My mum and dad were there and I can remember my brother and sister turning up as well. What then happened was the results from all my scans came back and they said, well, internally, Mike, yeah, you're okay. You're, you're pretty battered and bruised, but we've got some bad news. And then the big blow came and they said to me, I'd broken my back and I'd broken L1 vertebrae and basically disintegrated it into three pieces. Well, I spent the rest of that day in the A&E department of the Myla Hospital uh, and, and I was taken from there to various places for x-rays and CAT scans, MRI scans and what have you. 
uh, and the results of these scans showed that uh, I'd, I'd broken T6. I had what they call an unstable fracture to T6, which is a vertebrae in the back, uh, and I'd broken 10 ribs, the five lower ribs on both sides. Um, I kept telling them about the vision, but they, they sort of, they, they called an ophthalmologist to me. Uh, she had a look into the eyes and, and that was pretty much it really. From the A&E department, I was taken to the high dependency unit. I don't remember much about this because uh, I was more or less unconscious for most of the time there. I don't know whether that was drug induced or just the way it was after the accident. They then said, we have got two options. We can either send you to Walton Hospital or we can send you to Gaboin Orthopaedic Hospital. Thankfully, Gaboin, which was only a few miles away, had a spare bed for us. The patients come to this department with following either an accident or following some medical problem with the spinal cord. Uh, accidents can range from motorcycle accidents to car accidents. Falls are also a, 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 a problem, especially in industrial falls. But when we got to Gaboin on that Saturday, I can remember us having uh, had some more MRI and CT scans carried out. And uh, my consultant confirmed the news and basically sat on the edge of the bed with, with a laptop with my family around and said, this is a picture now of, of your back and we're going to show you now what damage you've done. And you didn't need to be an expert to see it. You could see how smashed up it was. But she said to me, a lot of people break the backs. People can break the backs, but and then get on with their lives quite okay. And she said, that's telling us that you've actually damaged your spinal cord. And I can remember saying to Dr. Short on that day that, does that mean I'm ever going to walk again? And she was quite open about the fact that the chances are I'd probably spend some of my time, if not all of it, in a wheelchair. I was moved down to Panto Ward, which is where they um, look after back injuries in Wrexham until they're stable enough to be moved to Gaboin. Because in the accident, I sustained a lot of internal swelling and bruising to multiple organs. Um, and because Gaboin are not, are not uh, they can't cater for this type of injury, I had to let all those settle down before I could go uh, and get the back looked at. Anyway, as I say, four weeks on Panto. Uh, and throughout my stay in the hospital, my toilet needs were catered for with uh, a catheter and with what they call an inkle sheet for the other business where you'd have to call a nurse when you need to go to the toilet. They'd come along, they'd slide the sheet underneath you and you just had to do it in the bed. And that was the most degrading thing I've ever had to do. To the point where, uh, after a six week stay in hospital, I lost a stone and a half in weight because I didn't want to eat because obviously that means going to the toilet and it was so degrading, I did not want to do it. I was lying in bed at about 11 o'clock and um, for some reason my, my little toe started to flicker for the first time and I can remember I was absolutely ecstatic and the first thing I did was I texted you on the phone didn't I that my toe had started moving and then I also shouted the nurses and the sister on the ward to come over and they were really pleased they were really pleased and they put it on the report and that night I really struggled to sleep. Anyway I was on panto for four weeks uh, the internal injuries settled down and I was deemed stable enough to be transferred to Gaboin where they would look after my back injury. The surgeon explained to me that an unstable fracture is if the vertebrae sort of envelops the spinal column and uh, an unstable fracture is where it's fractured on both sides and he explained to me that we had two options. The, the following day he could perform an operation to put a screw into either side of the vertebrae I didn't like the sound of that, so I asked what the other option was, and he said, uh, we'll give you two more weeks, and then we'll do a, another scan on you to see if nature's taking its course and the bone is actually knitting on its own. I decided to go for that option, and two weeks later, it had worked, uh, and then the bone was knitting together. I then had to go through a little bit of um, physiotherapy to build up the muscles that I'd lost uh, during the six weeks bed rest, uh, and then I was discharged. The spinal injury can affect the bony spine alone, in which case the problem will be an orthopedic problem mainly, without the spinal cord damage, without the paralysis, without the effects of the spinal cord damage. Uh, most of these individuals uh, uh, 
with a, an operation or without an operation are able to uh, uh, heal well and go home walking. After being discharged from Gobowin, uh, I was called back uh, by Rex and Myler Hospital to the ophthalmology department where they would now concentrate on the eyes. Uh, after numerous tests, uh, I, I was deemed to be blind, uh, effectively blind in the left eye, uh, with partial sight in the right eye. But my work colleagues were absolutely fantastic. And Kellogg's as a company were, 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 were tremendous. I couldn't thank them enough for being so supportive. And that support was good because what had happened was, um, I can remember clearly now um, a couple of my work colleagues came in one day to see me. And um, they were having a bit of banter with me like, like they used to. They were commenting on how since I've met Wendy, I've actually put on a lot of weight. And they believe um, I didn't fall off the ladder, I actually fell through it. And uh, I was getting comments like that and I can remember laughing that much that it actually for some reason triggered me off to go to want to go to the toilet for the first time without being told that my bladder was full. And I can remember saying that it was the best feeling ever having some control to actually go to the toilet unaided. So that to me was like winning the lottery. Um, the head ophthalmologist in Wrexham explained to me that we used to see a lot more of these injuries before the seatbelt law came in because uh, what I've got is a condition called traumatic putsch's retinopathy and this is caused, well it can be caused by too much blood pressure. Well obviously in the accident I broke 10 ribs and uh, T6 vertebrae so that's a pretty good uh, chest compression and what this does is it squeezes the body so that all the blood that would normally be in the stomach area is squeezed to other places and that much blood pressure cannot be tolerated by the eyes uh, and it's caused nerve damage and a blood clot to the retina of my left eye. And then the Monday morning came and in comes my consultant with a few other doctors and nurses and whoever else and they said to me right this is it then we're going to try to get you up and then all of a sudden in comes the wheelchair and I can remember so clearly saying I don't want that thing I'm not going in one of them and they said you might have to and I didn't realise quite how much muscle weight, wastage I'd, I'd actually suffered because of it. But what then happened, I just wasn't prepared for. And I got two nurses either side of me and they lifted me up. And I stood for the first time, but I only stood for a few seconds. And then that was it, back down. And I can remember feeling absolutely broken hearted with this. That I couldn't even walk, I couldn't walk to the wheelchair, I couldn't do anything. But my consultant said, that's brilliant, we're happy, because what it means is that we're going to teach you to walk again. It's going to be very painful, it's going to be a long process, and you're always going to suffer with pain no matter what happens. But the nerves which are feeding your glute muscles are still getting the signals and they're working. So that means we can teach you to walk. Uh, after numerous tests, uh, I, I was deemed to be blind, uh, effectively blind in the left eye, uh, with partial sight in the right eye and partial sight, that means I've got a lot of blind spots. The biggest one being just to the right of centre. Uh, this causes a lot, lots of different effects um, and it, it's really hard for people to understand. But I, I can see a pin on the floor sometimes, but if I move my head just a degree or so, that pin goes. The scary thing is, I think I'm still seeing the floor, but obviously I'm not. Uh, another example I give of that is when I'm looking down a road, if I, if I make a post centre of my vision and I wait for a car to come along the road and pass that post, uh, almost as soon as it's past the post, which is my centre of vision, I lose sight of the car. But I still think I'm seeing the road and that car can go for quite some distance before I regain it in my vision. And then the shock came, wasn't it, was when I went back to the ward and Sister Sue said to me, Sister Sue says, there's two guys who have come to see you, Mike, in um, fluorescent jackets. My initial reaction was that it was a couple of police officers who had come to see me and uh, see how I was. The reality of it was it wasn't. It was the, um, it was the HSE. So it was the health and safety had come to, come to see me. Um, then they wanted to know the details of the accident. For example, they asked it, did I have all my um, PPE? Was I wearing all the PPE gear? And I said, no. And they said, did you have your safety boots on? I said, no. I was wearing 
just my wellies. And the chainsaw, if you've been trained on it properly, and the answer to that was no as well. And I think for the first sort of half a dozen questions, the majority of the answers were no. And then the interview seemed to take a different sort of turn. And I was then informed that the, um, they were going to carry out a statement. Um, and there's a possibility that I could be prosecuted under the Health and Safety at Work Act 1974. I can no longer drive. I can no longer do my job. I'm employed as an electrician. Because I'm blind in the left eye, uh, you need two eyes to judge distances within five feet. Obviously, this is no good. I, I couldn't put a screwdriver onto a screw or anything like that. I just can't use tools anymore. Um, the, the biggest effect it's had on me is because I can't drive, I rely on people for lifts. I rely on taxis back and to to work, uh, trains and buses, but I don't see my family and friends when I would like to see them. I rely on other people coming to see me or coming to collect me and take me somewhere. They wanted to transfer me to the rehabilitation unit, but I didn't want to go at all, did I? Because I'd become sort of institutionalised with it all. And you can understand that after a period of long time in hospital that you do become very much treated as home but they wanted to now move me to, in my eyes, a different home, and I just didn't want to go. But anyway, I had to go, I realised it, and they kept saying to me, the next step is you'll be going home. And I was now in a rehabilitation unit with 99% of the guys in there and ladies will never ever be able to walk again, will never be able to go to the toilet unaided. And I felt embarrassed that I was in there, guilty. and guilty, that they could see me walking to a fashion, very slow. very slow, but I was walking and I was able to go to the toilet unaided. And I said to you, didn't I, how much I was hating it in there. You spent Sunday night and Monday night and Tuesday night, the Tuesday morning, you decided you couldn't take any more and asked to be discharged. When, when, we, when we come out of the hospital and I can remember, I said to Wendy, I wanted to see Thomas out, wasn't it? Did we see Thomas outside the gates? The school outside the school mm -hmm. gates. And I wanted Thomas to see his dad standing for the first time. With two sticks and body. I had a body brace yes. on and two sticks, and I, I could, could very hardly, ha hardly move at all, but I made it anyway. And I can remember seeing his face, and he was like smiling and beaming that this was his dad's now standing again. We went home, and I couldn't wait to go home. And I kept saying to Wendy, I can't wait to get home to have some proper food. I was going to sit at home and have a beer and a glass of wine. And I couldn't wait just to get back in there. And then we went in and um, it was, how many flights of stairs? Three, Three. about 20 minutes, 25 minutes. And I was, I needed help basically all the way to get up there. But I just wanted to get in. And I can remember going in. And as soon as I shut that door behind me, I just wanted to go back, back to hospital. And I was, I, there was nights that I was crying to get back. But I discharged myself, it was my own fault. My sister drove me down to the hospital and the ophthalmologist took me into a little room and he explained to me, this is now the worst part of my job, he says. I've got to register you as partially sighted. Well, you know what you can and can't see, but those words were just like having the rug pulled from underneath you. So I think I was in shock. When I left that room, my sister was waiting for me in the waiting room. Uh, and as, as she seen the look on my face, she asked me what was the matter. And I couldn't explain to her. I just walked past her and she's grabbing hold of my arm. What's the matter? What's the matter? So I'm walking up the corridor in the hospital. And I, and I must have walked for about 20 yards before I could control my emotions enough to turn to her and say, I've just been registered as partially sighted. At which point she broke down and I said, Sandra, don't worry, save it. I'm still here, I'm not in a wheelchair, this could have been a lot different story, I can manage, and that's what I do. After I was registered as uh, partially sighted, uh, social services came out to see me, they assessed my situation, they, they watched me making a uh, hot drink and different things, and they offered me a white stick, at which point I was aghast almost, uh, and I said I don't need a white stick, and she said, no maybe you don't, but some people need evidence that you've got a visual problem and they'll make more allowances for you. Uh, I've realised this since because someone in one of my circles of friends has actually accused me of having selective vision. Now that did hurt at the time, I'll be honest, but I had to tell myself, hold on a minute, your vision's your problem, 
their ignorance is theirs. But we got stronger and stronger and I started, gradually I was popping into work to see people. But that to me as well was a big, it was a big challenge for me to go back to work, being a different guy. I was a different Mike Ford from I was four or five months before that. And it was so difficult. I think um, it, it obviously has had a huge impact with the, uh, the initial sort of shock of the injuries that both Russ and Mike sustained from their, their various incidents. And then when you, you look at that impact across the workforce, there's obviously you know, a lot of people spend time talking about the impact not only to, to Mike and Russ, but also to them personally. And I think you know, it has quite a profound effect. And also it's quite shocking that it's actually happened outside of work. In terms of uh, Russ, I've known Russ for about 10 years as a, as a work colleague, um, obviously at Kellogg's Wrexham. But for myself and Mike, um, our history is a little bit longer. We, uh, we actually live next door to each other in a village locally to the, the plant. So I've known Mike since I was about five, so that's you know, quite a, a significant time. So obviously the, uh, the personal impact of, of Mike's accident was a little bit more profound for me. Um, I know a lot of people went to, to visit Russ and Mike at the, the various hospitals that they were in. So I think from a, a, a positive point of view, that shows a very caring nature that we have at the plant. But also you, you could see that it, I think it started to make people think more in terms of what they do, not only just at the plant, but also in the home life about the consequence of, of taking a risk and the effect that that can have, not only just on you personally, but the wider sphere of, of your sort of environment. Life's a lot more hectic for me <laughs> because I'm doing the majority of the things around the house and mm. and outside. Mm. I was needing help and support to walk. I needed help putting socks on, shoes on, trousers. Yeah, well, Wendy, yeah. Just, just generally, anything that involved me bending over or putting things on, Wendy had to do it all for me. I worked two days a week. Um, I was off for four months. Um, I went on my vacation after two months of the accident because I was having flashbacks and couldn't sleep. Um, I was just basically a wreck. Just couldn't focus on anything. It was an absolute nightmare, wasn't it? And I went on the tablet actually after Mike came home from Gaboin. Yeah. Um, I wasn't sleeping. I went on sleeping tablets. Um, and then... It was the mental stress, wasn't it? That it I was um, probably not the best patient to be around. No, I'd get confused and couldn't remember things. It just, as if I just, as if, if I'd just run into a brick wall, it just, when Mike come home, it was, it hit me then, didn't it? One of the problems with being, with having an accident, which has such an impact on your life, which is like what's happened to us and Mike, is although there's a physical side of it, there's also the psychological side of it. And often people feel like they're not worth anything anymore. And these guys are like, you know, they've got so much experience and they've still got a lot of value and a lot to offer the companies. And there's quite a big team of us really all working together. It wasn't just me, it was like the company doctor, their managers as well, because they had two different managers working together. And it was a great morale booster, I think, for both of them to come back into the workplace. Because that's your norm, you know, it's not normal to not be at work and not to be, and to be sat at home. You know, norm normality comes when you come back to work because you've got to get up in the morning, you know. You've got a role to play and you've got a lot to offer, not only a company, but society as a whole, really. And Russ and Mike have been amazing, really positive about their disabilities. And they manage them really well within the workplace. And they are of great value to Kellogg's who have managed to retain their skills and expertise. Part of what Mike and Russ have been doing has been to develop a motivational safety programme using their personal experience to get the message over that safety shouldn't stop when you leave work. It should be taken home. The slogan is Home Safe, Work Safe, Home Safe. And the key behavioural change is before you do anything at home, do a one-minute risk assessment. 
they've produced this excellent pocket safety card to support the message, copies of which are packaged with the DVD. We'll let Mike and Russ have the final word. Russ and I have both suffered serious injuries as a result of accidents outside of work, which I'm afraid have changed our lives forever. Those accidents wouldn't have happened in work due to the health and safety culture that exists here. So learn from our experiences and don't let your lives get changed as ours have done. When you leave work, don't leave health and safety in your locker. Take it with you and whenever you're doing a job at home or just having fun, do, do a, a quick, quick risk, risk assessment before you start.